2014. Now we're in 2016. We're talking from 2008 to 2016. Just to get me on. Stand over here because there's a camera in there. So I wish I'd worn a bigger t-shirt. They're shrinking the watch, don't they? They're shrinking the watch, don't they? I'll blame the wife. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I was asked if I would come and, and, and talk uh, again because last time we came we spoke about 2014 and 2014 and that is, whilst a massive campaign that we took on across a whole calendar year is a snapshot of everything that we've done as a family or, or I've done with part of it in the past eight years. So as it says there, MND and me, um, eight years are still counting because the funds are still coming in and we're still trying to raise more and more money as we go along. Why? Because of that guy. That's my dad. Okay? Um, some of you might think it's Bob Carroll jeans. It's my dad. Okay? Um, my mum's not on those photos because generally she's the one behind the camera. But we're a family unit, we're a close family unit, we always have been. And you can see, you know, even at a, uh, an age where I probably shouldn't be cuddling with dad in public anymore, I still was. Um, he was our best mate. He was our role model, he was everything that a dad should be. And unfortunately, motor neuron disease does what it does and it takes away great people. It always takes great people. Um, and my dad is no different to any of those. He was a rugby player, uh, not league, union, but a rugby player, man, of, uh, man and boy for Gentleman's 30 years. Game. Gentleman's yeah. game, yeah, yeah. Organised violence as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, no union, just the gentleman. There's still a lot of organised violence. <laughs> I guarantee it. Um, but they do not shake hands and have a beer in the bar afterwards. Unlike football, where I do my work, where they just don't seem to get on at all. Um, he was a college lecturer. So he was a lecturer for, again, sort of 30 years. Um, electrical installation. So there isn't an apprentice in our local area of the past two generations that doesn't know who Steve Collins was because he taught them. Um, and he was a dad, and a husband, and a family guy. He was an uncle, he was a great uncle, he was everything. Um, and in 2007, he was doing his lecture in the college, and he started to struggle to speak and say certain words. So he went on to the doctors, and it was actually myself that went with him one day. Um, I was sort of about 22 at the time. Um, and we went along to the doctors and he was diagnosed as having a mind stroke. Okay, fair enough. You know, people can come back from that, that's good. Um, the irony being that he struggled with words that started with STR, so to struggle to say that he'd had a stroke was quite a difficult thing. But as things went on, um, he didn't get any better. He didn't show any signs of, of progression. And I went off to America coaching football um, and I came back in the November of 2007 and eventually we were told actually it's not a stroke, it's motor neuron disease. And so things suddenly change. As it says there, February 2008 was eventually when he got his full diagnosis and your lives are never going to be the same again. We all know that. I'm not here to dwell on it. I'm not here to talk about the negative side of MND. Um, what I am here to do is to try and show you how Although MND is devastating, we all know it is, and, and, and what it brings not only to the person that's diagnosed but to everyone around them, actually, some positive things can come out of it. Okay, and the positive things that can come out of it are that it changes a person. So I went from being a 23-year-old, just finished university, not really giving a damn about anyone, just working away and then drinking all my money at a weekend, to having to become a carer and thinking about other people. I came back from America and never went back out to America again, even though my plan was to go and coach out there and live out there. Subsequently, that means that my life changed in a lot of different ways, and I'll go into that uh, in a positive point of view, and I'll go into that a little bit later on. So, we decided as family, we're going to have one last holiday. If this is what's going to happen, we're having one last holiday. So, we went on a cruise. And as you can see, that's four Brits abroad, because everyone's got a bright red face. <laughs> that's what happens when Brits go abroad. Uh, but we went on a nice cruise. Dad, bottom right, uh, you can just, you know, just sort of see MND taking its, uh, taking its toll there. The smile was just starting to disappear. Um, 
However, the eyes, the eyes are always there. Um, and if you've read thumbprint, uh, there's a, there's, there is a, a, an edition of thumbprint that has got a poem called The Ice Habit, which is in there, and that was written by my mum, and it's all about my dad. Uh, I'll repost it on Facebook and stuff later so you can have a read, and I've posted it a few times because for me it sums up the one thing that motor neuron disease can't do is take away a spark in someone's eye, and we know that. Okay? So, we're there. So, me and my brother decided, well, we want to try and do something about this. <laughs> 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 we wanted to get involved in fundraising, but like a lot of people in the room and a lot of people that have helped the branch, when someone says let's start fundraising, how, what, when, what do you do? It, it, you know, it's it's not necessarily an easy thing, and in this day and age, actually, fundraising is, is a real difficult thing to do because there's so many charities out there, so many great charities that are raising money for so many great causes, and in the world of social media it seems like there's somebody doing something every day that, that they want money for uh, and with the way things have gone economically in the country actually people are less likely to part with their money because we've been in recessions and you know and that's, that's it's a tough time so you've got to do things which people will want to be part of so things like this event that's going on at Bolton there's a day out there for two pounds why wouldn't you want to go and get a full day's activity for two pounds? You can't go anywhere locally and get a day's <laughs> fun and enjoyment for two pounds, not possible, unless you go down the park and through. So you need to want to do things that people enjoy. So we took it upon ourselves, right, well, we'll do things which Dad would enjoy. Whilst he's with us, let's do things that he'll enjoy. So he loved his sport and he loved quizzes. So we organised a quiz night. Um, those of you that were here last time, my brother talks even better than I do. He's great on a microphone, so he's a quiz master. He's a host of Black Tie Ball, which I believe he's coming up in November to do the Black Tie Ball. Um, consequently, that means I get to come with him, which is good. So I, I get a night out, um, which is great. Um, he has to stay sober, and I can, I'll be found at the bar somewhere, probably. Um, but we organised a quiz night, and you know, friends and family, and just people that had uh, met my dad. You know, ex-students came along with my dad, and we, we sort of rented out the local social club, and, and we started our fundraising efforts, shall we say. And I think that night itself raised somewhere along the lines of about, about £1,300 on the first time we did it, because um, we had a raffle and all sorts of things going on around it. As well as quiz nights, we did sports events. So we did a cricket team, and we played the 2020 match against the local cricket club, um, all under the guise of Team MND, and that's what we call ourselves, and we've always called ourselves that. And that's made up of University friends of my brother, university friends of mine, our ex-next-door neighbour, our cousin, and a couple of the older guys involved are actually uh, other lecturers from the college where my dad worked. And again, you know, a cricket match with a barbecue at the side on a nice, relatively sunny day in England, and we get them over now and again. Um, and again, that raised good money. But as that started to happen, I started to think to myself, I'm enjoying this, and I want to do more. But what can I do? How can I get involved? What, what can I do? So I started to search on the MND Association website and, and all the information online around fundraising and what you can get involved with and there's all the different challenges you can take part in. And this is where the next sort of positive thing around MND comes from. I decided that if I'm going to go and fundraise and I'm going to raise money for the association, I might as well go and do things that I've never done before and change my life in a different way. So I signed up to uh, trek the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu. Um, over in Peru. And I signed up on the International Challenge and I was one of 39 people that signed up to take on that challenge, all raising money for the Motor Neuro Disease Association. And so I sent off the information, you had to sort of put a registration form in and then they would send it, let you know if you've been selected uh, and we'd go from there. And it was time to take things to the next level. But as it says there, whilst dealing with the hardest day in my life, whilst all this was going on, Dad had progressed quite rapidly, and he got all the palsy. We know how aggressive that can be. Uh, within that, there was also a 13 week stay in hospital after a fractured skull that happened as well, where he fell down the stairs because the council hadn't moved the draining time for the downstairs wet room. The list goes on. We all know those sorts of things. We're all quite, you know, those things happen all the time for us, unfortunately. On November 24th, 2009, Dad passed away. Um, 
hardest day of my life, darkest day of my life, without a doubt. I remember finishing work, coaching kids football, half past four, picking my phone out of my pocket and having 17 missed calls. I remember it vividly. 17 missed calls from my mum, my brother, my uncle, my aunt and my cousin. Which straight away is just alarm bells, because most of those people don't ring me anyway. Um, so alarm bells are ringing, I pick up the voicemail off my cousin, it just says, Pete, get to the hospital now. That's all it said. So I drove from Derby to Burton, which is about 14 miles, um, so it should take you about, I don't know, 25 minutes, it took me about 14, I think. Um, probably got some points on my license, didn't really care. Got to the hospital to be greeted by my mum and my auntie, my mum and sister, to say, Dad's in a bad way. Uh, he's come back from respite, because he'd been to the respite for the day, which he hated, but it, it was needed because mum needed a break from being a, you know, a seven day a week carer. And uh, he'd actually uh, had a respiratory arrest in the community ambulance on the way back from respite. So when he was dropped off at home, he wasn't breathing. The guy just wheeled him off the community ambulance, put him in the house, walked off, thanks very much. Mum went to him, no response, not really. Okay, it's not great. Um, so the ambulance was called, he went up to uh, hospital, but dad being dad, and again, anyone knowing anyone with MND, they're stubborn, okay? In a good way. Because being stubborn, whilst you've got motor neuron disease, I know I was looking at you there, John. <laughs> <laughs> but being stubborn while you've got motor neuron disease is what you need. Because it's fighting spirit that's going to keep you on this planet for a lot longer. Okay, and I got from Derby to Burton, my brother got from Birmingham to Burton, and in that time, they got Dad breathing again. To the point where all of us were in the room, and then he passed away. So if there's one thing I can take from it, is that Dad just, just clung on for that time, to have that little bit of family time, and that's, that's, what, that's really important. Um, there's only one other thing I can remember from that night, She's being wheeled into a little side ward after Dad had passed away. And everyone's sort of been really quiet. And the hospital radio being on very low level. And uh, reached for the stars being on from S Club 7. And, and that, that's no lie, that's what happened. It's a, it's a cheesy song, but it has a lot of relevance. So it's a great, you know, for me, every time it's on the radio, it gets put on full blast. So that was November the 24th. November the 25th consisted of making numerous cups of tea for family members as they came around and talked about the good times. Uh, November the 26th, this big envelope lands on my doormat and I open it up, it's addressed to me. I open it up and it says, uh, you've been selected to be part of the International Challenge to Trek the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu for the Motor Neuron Disease. At which point I threw it on the floor as a petulant 24 year old, not interested, don't want to do it. I mean, this, it starts the other, not doing it. Followed by, I click around the airbar and mum said, don't be so stupid, this is what your dad would have wanted, you get yourself sorted, we're raising some money. And that's, those words still ring to me now, and that's where we went. So, we started doing things again, we started fundraising, and eventually I got myself out to Peru. A slimmer version of me went out to Peru, <laughs> in a t-shirt that fitted, and uh, with a really bad fisherman's hat by the looks of it. So I went out to Peru. Peru, uh, the, the Inca Trail is a four day trek. Um, it's still a challenge that the Motor Neuro Disease Association do. So if anyone's interested, it's a fantastic place to go. Um, you trek for four days, you get very friendly with wet wipes, um, and the other person in your tent, whether you like them or not. Um, and you trek to a highest point, which is just at the top of here, which coincidentally is called Dead Woman's Pass. It sounds really pleasant when you're walking up there. But supposedly it's because the lady's hair and face is there, and then her breast, and then she lies across the top of the pass. You can see that. When you've been walking for three days, you don't really care what it looks like. <laughs> you just get up there. So you trek for four days, but as you go over that brow, you dip down, you dip down into a little cauldron of mountains, and in the middle is that place. And that's Machu Picchu, one of the seven uh, wonders of the world. Martin. There it is, 2009, Machu Picchu, as part of a group of 39 with the old MND Association branding um, and the Peruvian flag. And I'm pleased to say that when we did that, I raised £4,900. 
So I did that, that was 2009, September time. I came back, sat down at home, had a bit of a rest. Went into 2010, and in 2010 I was watching Comic Relief. And we all watch it, don't we? We last about three or four hours and then we have to turn over because it's just a bit much. But we all donate and then turn over, hopefully. Hopefully. The Comic Relief came on and I saw these guys. And I looked at them and I thought, that mountain in the background looks fun. Looks fun. So that's Kilimanjaro in the background. And I know you've had a presentation about Kilimanjaro because I know someone in the room has been up there. Okay. Um, but I looked at it and there's a group there and I thought, you know what, that guy on top left, that overweight cigarette smoking DJ who loves swilling beer down his neck every weekend. I thought, you know what, if he can do it, I reckon I'm not a crap at that. Sounds like fun. So 2010, wrote off to, well, emailed off to the MND Association again, said I'm up for another one, Kilimanjaro, 2011, bring it on. I'm interested. And so we got into fundraising again. But as we go along with fundraising, the key for me is everything you do, the next time you do it, it's got to be bigger and better because you've got to get those people there again and you've got to get more people there. So everything you do has got to be a little bit bigger and a little bit better. So we did. We did another cricket match with more people attending and a, a younger looking team so we had more of a chance of winning. Um, we had a bigger barbecue with more sausages and more burgers to sell and we had more cake and we had a, a big cricket tea and we raised a good chunk of money again. On top of that, he borrowed my t-shirt by the way as well. <laughs> on top of that, we started doing quiz nights again. Because we love doing them, my brother loves writing them, I love organising them. That night there, um, again, fundraising is all about who you know. A friend of mine who I work with, his brother owned a social club. He said, I'll give you the social club for free. I said, well you take the bar takings, I'll take everything else. And we'll split it that way. So 39 teams in a quiz night. Jam packed room, couldn't fit any more tables and chairs in. Uh, again, about another £1,300 raised on that night alone through um, the quiz night itself, entry fees, raffles, blackout cards, and anything you can name it. You know, if there was any loose change in anyone's pocket, we were going to tip them upside down and shake them before they left the room. Okay? So we did all those sorts of things, and we did other things as well. We did a charity football match. We did, you know, and basically, just everything I do with fundraising is stuff I enjoy. Because if you take the fun bit at fundraising, it's just raising, or de raising, if you can spell it correctly. Um, it's got to be fun, okay? So everything we do, we enjoy with what we do. And eventually, um, we went to Kilimanjaro, and I went along with, with my girlfriend at the time, and we got on the plane, and we sat on the plane, and all the other guys were there. And this was a challenge which was a mixture of charities, it wasn't just motor neurone disease. Um, there was 11 of us trekking for, for MND, and then there was guys for young diabetes, MS, um, all sorts of different charities, um, which again brings a different kind of feel to, to a trek because you've got different conversations to have. Um, when you trek with people that are all trekking for MND, there's only, you, you can only have so many hours before you get to that conversation of what's your link to MND, and you know what's going to be said. The great thing about trekking with people for the charities is there were people there that were that were fighting illnesses and beating illnesses and doing it for sons and daughters that were fighting it and it was just different okay? and it brought a group together and it, and it was fantastic. So we're on the plane and this guy is in, well, you're all sitting alphabetical order when you go on these trips so you have to sit next to the person with the surnames near you and um, you don't have a choice and you all have to wear a t-shirt so they know what you look like and it's like going on a school trip and this guy sort of turned around to the seat and he says ah. Oh, Great, he said, what training have you been doing? And I thought, well, I live in Derbyshire, so I've been in the Peak District, you know, I thought, that sounds really good, you know, I've been to Edale, I've been here, I've been there, I've been, he says, oh, right, yeah, me, me, and, uh, me and Jim, we, uh, we've been in an altitude chamber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, because, you know, we've heard, you know, we've heard the symptoms of altitude are just unbelievable. You, you, have you not been in one? No. Oh, right, sort of turned around, sat down. I looked at Cecilia next to me and I sort of went, we might have overrated this a little bit. The bloke behind me, yeah, we went in an we went and um, uh, we went on a trip to France and we went in the Alps and did a few. Uh, right, okay. Edel's really not looking so great. <laughs> Although Jacob's ladder at Edel, if anyone wants to walk up and down that, it's hard work, I'll tell you that. It, um, but, so you get there and then you're on the plane and you, you're flying, uh, you, we flew to Nairobi first and we get another plane from Nairobi to Tanzania. 
and, and I thought when you went to Africa it was like sunshine and, and, and then you look out the plane and you see that and you think, oh, that's, that's pretty, it's nice. And then the, uh, the captain comes on and he's like, if you look to your left you'll see Mount Kilimanjaro. Oh, that looks quite big. <laughs> Uh, Mount Kilimanjaro is uh, 5,895 metres above sea level, which equates to 19,000 feet, about half the, uh, half the height that we're currently cruising at. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> Everyone's sort of looking around in the group thinking, and we're supposed to climb that? Okay, right. So Kilimanjaro comes, we get there, we, un we unpack all the bags and everything, and you start to talk about what people have done with fundraising, and you pick up ideas, and, and you bounce ideas off each other, and you make friends for life <laughs> when you fundraise. It's a fact. Okay. Um, Kilimanjaro, we took a five-day trek up. It's a five-day trek up, a two-day trek down. Um, not because you just roll down. Um, mm -hmm. I wish you could, uh, but you have to sort of acclimatise your way yourself in the way up because of how high it is. And if you don't acclimatise yourself properly, you start to look a little bit like that when you get near the top. Um, so that's me, and this is where it sounds silly, that's me 200 metres from the top. Which sounds nothing at all, but 200 metres from the top is about two and a half hours of, two and a half hours? Yeah, yeah. It's about 100 metres an hour, depending on the pace you walk at. And the pace you walk at to Kilimanjaro is snail's pace. Um, when you get to that, when you get to the summit night, you summit overnight, you get to a point for sunrise, and then you carry on to, to the highest point, past the glaciers. That's how I felt. Um, I then sort of gave myself a bit of a reality check because the porter that was stood next to me called Joseph, and, and again, this guy sticks in the head, the, the African porter next to me, Joseph, in his flip-flops, carrying, carrying just bits and bobs, you know, just sort, of, <laughs> just sort of bouncing along, enjoying life, and there's me thinking, I'm gonna throw up in a minute, I feel awful, the attitude's got me. I'm not sure I can walk another 200 metres, and Joseph just turned to me, hey, i get you there. I thought, oh, you'll get me there. No, I'm all right, I'm good. At this point, Cecilia, my girlfriend, had had to go down, because she's half thermic, so she went down. Um, i get you there. I thought, like, Joseph, I'm done, mate. I just want to go down, I'm done. i get you, give me your back. So he takes my rucksack, puts it in, come on. Just starts walking, and we almost essentially are congered to the top, <laughs> just sort of holding on to this port. Um, I didn't kick any legs out because I just couldn't. But we sort of got there, and eventually, you get to a sign, and the majority of people are really happy to be there. If you look at me in the middle, I'm just like, <laughs> can't get off this mountain, I'm done. Um, about 30 seconds after that photo, I just threw up and it wasn't very pleasant. And, they were like, yeah, let's get you down, and I had to be sort of escorted down off the mountain. Uh, the two guys on the left, uh, JJ on the far left and Fiona next to me, um, luckily, they climbed uh, Machu Picchu with me as well, and came and did the trek two years later, and I'm still in touch with both of them now, great friends, um, like I say, friends for life. JJ was my tent buddy uh, in Peru, luckily I didn't have to share a tent with him at Kili, because he just talks <laughs> constantly. Altitude doesn't affect him, he just talks and talks and talks at three, four, five in the morning. Oh, man, tomorrow's going to be a great day, isn't it? Tomorrow's going to be a yeah, <laughs> Let me sleep. But he just goes, but he's a great guy, I'm still in touch with him. He was similar sort of age to me, lost his dad, you know, similar stories all around. Uh, so that was Kilimanjaro. We came back down from Kilimanjaro 2011, that was the October time, and uh, then it was time to do some serious fundraising uh, because. I've done that. That wasn't serious one, really. I'll explain in a minute, Barbara, why. That's what we raised uh, for Kilimanjaro. That was serious fundraising for the Motor Neuron Disease Association, but after that, I had to start fundraising for a wedding. So then that's serious fundraising. <laughs> uh, Not so, yours. Not yours. What, my wedding? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I got engaged on Kilimanjaro. Um, so I went up with a girlfriend, came down with a fiance. And so we came down to 2012. 2012 was dedicated to fundraising for a wedding, different kind of fundraising. The fun bit disappears, it's just raising. Um, and then 2013 came along and we've been doing a bit more and me and my brother were chatting away. And this is where some of you will have heard some of this, so I apologise if you have, but there's other people in the room that have. Sort of got the feeling that if we're going to raise more money, and I know the numbers that we're putting there are big, 
but if we're gonna if we're gonna really have a go at this and really raise some serious money, we need more people. Because more people's more opportunities, bigger networks, more people we can ask, <coughs> more people we can get to events, uh, more people that can spread the word and spread the awareness of what we're doing and why we're doing it. So how could we create Team M and D? Now any of you in there sort of Hello? <laughs> Not twice if you're uh, <laughs> or want to be on that physio table for the other one. How could we create Team MD? And any of you that utilise social media, you'll see the MD Association using this all the time now. Hashtag Team MD. Everything they do, fundraising, campaigning, um, literally anything. The staff days, everything is hashtag Team MD. And I'm pleased to say that came from us. We started that. And I had a phone call um, December 2015 from the head of community at the MD Association saying, Oh, you know, uh, you know that team of MD thing you kept using on social media all the way through 2014? Yeah. Could we use it? Yeah, I can't. Well, there you go. Couldn't really not let them use it. We put it on social media, it's out in public domain. Um, but the fact that they kind of asked and the fact that it's there again makes me quite proud because it's something which we kind of created and drummed up as a bit of fun and suddenly it's being used everywhere. Uh, so how did we create Team MND? So there was myself, there was my brother John, there was another guy called Ant. Uh, Ant's got a, a different link to MND. He's a photographer that does sort of lots of commission work and a lot of the commission work he does is for the association. So he was down at the campaigns weekend last week with Greg, taking photos of that. Um, and he does lots of different work and we met him through some of the broad appeal events that Stuart Broad and Chris Broad and cricketers had set up and, and we uh, met him through a few of them. I'd then sort of given a little nudge and said, oh, do you do weddings? <laughs> uh, he says yes. I said, do you do mates rates? He said yes. And we were friends for a while. Um, so he sort of shot my wedding as we were sort of leading up to all the wedding and everything. Um, he says, oh, I haven't fundraised for a while. Do you want this in blind? Do you want blind? Yeah. Do you want blind? Yeah. Yeah. I just see you squinting away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nothing, I'm nothing if not accommodating. Um, is that better? Is it? Um, oh, wedding and, yeah, we met Ant. He, as we were doing sort of the stuff leading up to the wedding, um, Ant said to me, I haven't done any fundraising for the association for a while. I've done, done the marathon a couple of times. And I've done it for other charities. I've done the Edinburgh Marathon as well. He said, I've turned 40 in 2014, so I want to do something big. I was like, lighting at 30, so I fancy doing something big again. I'll just have to sort of swing it with the, with the wife to be that we can do something. And then my brother came to me, and, and I know he said this last time, he said, oh, I've got this idea. I want to do 365 days of pain. So take a little step back and say, no reason that's for me, but what have you got in mind? So, well, I want to do physical events all the time. I just want to keep going all year long and see what we can come up with. I was like, well, let's, let's sit down, let's have a chat about it between the three of us. There's something there, there's three of us, more people, more opportunities, we've got a team. Let's see what we can come up with. So we sat down for dinner one night, we had a bottle of wine, another bottle of wine, and another bottle of wine, and then we came up with 2014 and 2014. So 2014 and 2014, the premise of it, and again, I apologise if some of you heard it, um, the idea was to run and cycle 2014 miles of events in a calendar year, as a team. All miles to be completed by the three of us together, no training miles counted, um, events all around the country. That was the aim. The second aim was to try and raise £30,000 for the charity. £10,000 each, that was the aim. So 2013 we've got a logo made up, which is a guy on a bike, you sort of see the wheels, that's his head, that's his arm, ish. Um, that's what the creative designer said. Like, Took me a while, so it's like a magic card thing. We have to kind of, uh, but we got a logo, we got some kit, so we, we got the trainers, make ourselves look the part. Uh, we got the bikes, and we got the kit on, and, and we sort of just lost a little bit of weight eventually. And we got ourselves fit in 2014. We launched in the January at Citra uh, over in Sheffield, which is the uh, Sheffield University hub for, for the research into neurological diseases. We launched there, they gave us the, the room free for the evening, and then Greg came over for that. Um, and then we set out, and we started our event in March, and we finished them in the November. So we did 2014 miles 
essentially in nine months. How that kind of looks, there's us the team. So John on the left, me with a ridiculous quick haircut, and, and with the haircut we've had for about the last 15 years. Um, and we set ourselves out, we got started, and that's what it looked like. And I know we put these all out on the table last time for those of you who were here. Um, the events are on the left, and in brackets is the mileage. And if you add the mileage up, anyone wants to get the calculator out, more than welcome to do it, but it does come to 2014 miles, I can assure you. Checked it, triple checked it, um, and I went through it, so I know it feels like 2014 miles. So we ran, we did 10Ks, half marathons, duathlons, we did John Groats Land's End on a bike, we cycled around the six big test cricket grounds, so the Oval, Lord, Sedge Baston, Trent Bridge, heading the Old Trafford over four days. But again, it was all, again, running and cycling, it's things we enjoy, going to the cricket grounds, we love cricket, we always used to go and watch the cricket with my dad, so it's something we enjoyed again. Um, it was all stuff which sort of brought dad with us along the journey. Um, I should say at this point as well, um, I missed it slightly, but uh, 2012 we also lost my aunt in Plymouth, uh, she's my dad's sister. So we've been through it twice as a family, uh, we've seen the devastation it causes, so it, it sort of spurred us on even more. Alongside the fundraising and alongside the physical stuff, you've got to We've got to sort of do the logistical side of things as well. To put a campaign like that on and to raise a sum of money like £30,000 is no mean feat. You know, you guys as a branch have a committee and you plan out what you're planning to do for the year to try and raise certain amounts and engage with a certain amount of people and raise awareness. We had to do the same as three individuals. Um, so we set about, we had the launch night, we tried to keep a brand throughout everything we were doing, we tried to engage with local press, we sort of met with wider partners, so we did lots of bucket collections for the charity. We ran football matches, that's at Chesterfield Football Club. We went on the radio, we went into schools talking about MND and raising awareness that way. We utilised the skill sets we've got, so I did a studio day. I organised the football side of things, working in sport. My brother did the radio stuff because that's his background. And we just utilised everything that we could and all the circles of influence that we had to try and make it as big as we could. We got our own branded gear, so every time we turned up at an event, people knew who we were and what we were about. We had our black tie balls, probably not going to be as good as the one in Manchester later this year, but we'll see. Um, we made a link with a local running club. Uh, great thing about running clubs is there's lots of people that love running, which is a weird thing. Um, and they're going, yeah, we'll turn up at events and one for you, give us a vest. You know, you're crazy, yeah, go, there you go. And they did, and the running club itself, as a group of people, they raised £14,000 for the charity in the year that we were. They previously raised, their, their charity of the years that they picked, they previously raised about £1,000, and they raised £14,000 in the year that we were with them. Because they got a personal link, there was an ex-member of the club, been recently diagnosed, and it just brought them all together and gave them something to focus on for the whole year. And eventually, we started to create Team MND. So Team MND, how it came about was that three people raising £30,000 is a big feat. Anyone raising £10,000 is a big feat. Anyone raising five, one, whatever. You know, even listening to what those schools have done, primary schools raising £500, that's a huge feat to do. Especially when none of the people that attend the school are essentially probably, you know, none of them are in, they're not putting their own money in, they're having to go and ask for it. It's a big thing. So what we did was thought, well, if we spread ourselves wider and get more people to ask for more money, there's a good chance we might be able to have a crack at it. So we did something called Be the Fourth Man. And the Be the Fourth Man campaign was come and join us on an individual event for 2014. I'm not saying I want you to come and cycle and run 2014 miles, but if you fancy doing a 10K, come and join us and pledge to raise for the charity. If you want to do a half marathon or you want to cycle for the day, come and join us. So we got people involved. So, you know, the dog 10K is the top picture. We asked, is there any person, one person that wants to join us? 42 people said yes. So I'm on the phone to the association, can I have 42 t shirts? I mean, nine smalls, one slightly bigger for me, you know, a few more and a few more. Uh, 42 people did the dog 10K. The shell 10K, bottom left. Um, apologies for the dodgy pink shorts, we were on a bet to raise a bit more money. Um, 
39 people did the shout 10 k runs. The running club on the right hand side at the bottom, um, they came up with this idea of we want to do a European marathon. It's something we've been thinking about for a long time. We think it fits with your campaign perfectly. So well, what's the European marathon? So we're not really sort of put marathons into our training because to, to train for a marathon is, is serious. Um, you know, not that that's not serious, but to train for one event to only get 26 miles back when you're trying to get 2014 is serious. And that's not me underdoing what a marathon takes out of something. It's just the mileage is quite small. And so we said, well, what's your identity? Well, we want to, what we do, European marathon, so we'll do it in kilometres. We're going to run five kilometres in nine countries in 24 hours. So, okay, sounds interesting. Talk to me a little bit more. So, right, well, the idea is we're going to take a minibus, we're going to go down to Dover, we're going to go across to Belgium, we're going to sit on the Belgium and Holland border and run a 10 kilometre loop there. Then we're going to drive down to uh, Germany, do a five kilometre route in Germany, into Luxembourg, into France, down to uh, Liechtenstein, then to Switzerland, then to Austria, and finishing Italy. So 24 hours, that's sounds, uh, that's sounds possible. He says, who fancies doing that? Said, well, no. well, there's 32 of us that are up for it, and there's three spaces on the minibus. All right, we'll go. So we went, and we did it, and we came. Um, and the, little, the, the best thing about it was we picked up the minibuses from Derby, where we started, and we drove all the way down, we did all the running, with an hour to spare, stayed overnight in Innsbruck in Austria, we drove all the way back on the Sunday, and as we dropped the car, uh, the minibuses off, there's no line, as we dropped the minibuses off, it clocked 2,040 miles of driving as well. How's it that? Ish. About 2,030 <laughs> points of the it. So we did that, and there's Team M&D. Um, and that's how we did it, we just got more people involved. And I'm pleased to say a lot of these people are still fundraising for the M&D Association locally. Um, that's not down to us, that's down to what the charity does to people when they get involved. Um, we all know that when you get involved in the M&D Association, you become, you become a lifer, don't you? You're in, and you're in, and you don't go out. Um, and that's great, and we need, you know, the best thing about it is there's a lot of young people on there as well that want to keep doing it, and will do it for a number of years. Um, and that's great, because eventually, they will come a point where they don't have to do it. It's going to come a point where they don't have to do it. I'm, I'm positive that that's going to happen at some point. Um, that's us at the end of Land's End, just to prove that we actually did it. Uh, the van's around the corner where we drove down. <laughs> just after that photo, we threw our bikes into the water as well, because they'd had enough of that. Didn't really do that either, but I wish I had. Um, ten days that took. Ten long, wet days of summer, as English summers are along with Hurricane Bertha in the middle, which was pleasant. Um, and we did it. And I'm pleased to say that we set ourselves that target, £30,000 to raise, and that's what we did in a year. Um, the only thing that upsets me is it didn't get to 60. Because mm -hmm. if, if we'd have smashed it and doubled it, I'd have been really, uh, I'd have just, that would have made it up. But I think it's 87% over what we said we would do. Um, so we raised £56,000. And the downside of that was, at one of the events, uh, I fell off my bike, and it hurt. And I've still got scars on my elbow, and the worst little bit is, this is what looks like a little graze that like, a little child gets when they're in the playground, on my bum cheek, actually meant that I uh, detached all the cartilage in my hip joint. So, from the end of 2014, I haven't ran or cycled since, or played any sport, hence why the t-shirt was fit. So I've got an excuse, you see. Um, so I haven't been able to run or cycle because for 18 months I've been battling an injury and I'm still battling it now. I'm waiting for an operation to get it fixed. Which means that people start throwing lemons at you, don't they? And when you get lemons, you want to make lemonade. Or, lemon tea, or tea. So, after 2014 finished, I made a pledge at home that I was going to take a break from fundraising. So I've done enough, you've not seen me, I've been out every weekend training, I'm running or cycling and fundraising. I'm going to have a break. And I did really well. I got to September 2015. And just before September started, I was sort of getting a bit of an itch in August. <coughs> I need to do something. I miss it. Fundraising for me is it's everything. It's my breathing process. It's my release. It's my hobby to some extent. Especially now I'm not doing any sport. Um, I will quite happily stand at the weekend with a bucket, wherever. I've got a permit, obviously, 
um, or I will sell the cake. I will do whatever it takes to raise money for this charity. Um, and that's been done. I've shaved my head, I've waxed my legs, I've done all sorts of stupid things over the years. As well as those stupid things I've just shown you on the of mountains and throw it to the top. So I got to August 2015 and I've sat with some friends in the park and we were having a cup of tea. Um, I was watching that little lad run around and I was a bit jealous because he was running around and I wasn't allowed to. Um, and they said, well, we were chatting away and they were talking, it was sort of a year, August 2015 was a year from the Ice Bucket Challenge. We were chatting about that and the phenomena it was and the impact that it had and the money it raised. And they said, well, why don't you try something like that? Why don't you try something different? I said, well, I said I'm not sure that's going to happen ever again. I don't think that will be beaten. It's just, it was a one-off phenomena that that sort of catapulted the MD Association in front of everyone's eyes. And I'm pleased to say that it's still there now, to some extent. Not just because of that, but it's played its mm. part. And they said, well, why don't you look at something? Why don't you do something you can do from home? What about a social media campaign? And they said, well, what, what have you got in mind? So I had a little sip of tea. They said, well, why don't you do a selfie? Like a selfie, I do like a no makeup selfie and all those sorts of things. And so, well, why don't you do it with a cup of tea? So what's the link? How does that work? Well, and then we started to think, and we started to, you know, I just started jotting some ideas down. And you think about actually, a cup of tea is that everyday task that we all take for granted. Coming from work, kettles aren't make a cup of tea. Get up in the morning, kettles aren't make a cup of tea, or coffee, whatever your preference is. You know, go to work, first thing you do, make a cup of tea, before, you know, if you like me. Um, turn the laptop on, walk away, and make another cup of tea. Um, I'm really productive at work. Um, but then, you know, on the flip side, and this is how it kind of all came about, a person with motor neuron disease might not be able to flip the kettle on and make a cup of tea. Or pick them up. Or take a sip. Or even ask for a cup of tea. And if you're a carer for someone with MD, the chance you actually having five minutes to sit down and have a cup of tea are pretty minimal. So we did it. And I'm pleased to say that I've kind of built up a, a network of people through social media and it grows every other day. There's always people adding me and there's people in this room that I've never met before face to face, but I've had conversations with online. Um, and I started sounding a few people out. What do you think to this? Tea for MND, you take a self tea, selfie with your mug, you make a donation, you nominate someone else to have a go. What do you think? And they all said, yeah, give it a go, why not? So on September the 1st, we launched T for m &D. And the premise was, take a selfie with your cup of tea, a self tea, give yourself the uh, m &D thumbs up, have a picture talk, make a donation using a text code or online, or donate in another way, and then get other people involved. So I waited up till midnight as it turned to the 1st of September, and I sent the picture out on Facebook and social and Twitter. Oh, T for M&D is launched. I don't know. Uh, done a bit of work behind the scenes. I set up the Twitter page. I set up the Facebook page. I've uh, done a just giving page. Set up the text code. Done all those sorts of things that, that you need to do when you're fundraising. And I put it out there. And I went to bed. And I woke up and I went to work. And by 10 o'clock on the 1st of September, we've raised £400. Oh, okay. Phone's buzzing constantly. People copying me in on Twitter and Facebook. Everyone at work looking at me. Why's your phone buzzing? I was like, oh, it's work related call. Um, by lunchtime, we'd raised a thousand pounds. This is just my work. And it sort of, it did start to snowball a little bit. And then um, we got to the AGM last year, the National AGM for the Association, um, which I think was the 14th or 15th of September. Check in. Uh, next year's is the 10th, I think it's on the book. Check it. Um, and we went there, and I think at that point we raised about £2,000 in 14 days. And I thought, you know what, this is going alright. So, you know, we've got all the gear, and that's how you do it. It's really simple. Uh, that t shirt used to fit. It's a running theme. Went to the ADM and we started taking selfies with staff and stuff. So, Sarah Milner's on there, Sandra Smith, who I know has been here and presented before. Uh, 
Peggy Styles, bless her, in her orange trousers. <laughs> she loves her orange trousers. Oh, her orange trousers go everywhere. <laughs> I'm pleased to say, Alan Owen almost looks happy. Uh, almost. <laughs> almost. <laughs> but yeah, well, it's in his hand, look, but it's not quite. So, what happened was at the end of the AGM, I sat there all the way through the AGM, and T Frem and D had popped up on their sort of highlights reel. And I thought, oh, they are, they are noticing, so that's good. And uh, they sort of got to the uh, any other business part of the, the AGM at the end of the day. And they said, uh, this is your opportunity to text in or, or whatever, any questions that you've got. So I, should we take a selfie for MND? And we did. Hey. And that's picture is, that picture is used everywhere <coughs> on the MND Association website now. Um, I'm pleased to say. And there's a number of fantastic people on there. There's also a couple of people, unfortunately, that are no longer with us. Um, but it's on there. There's people in this room that are on it. And that was us at the AGM. But after that, quite quickly, the money sort of stopped. And me being me, I'd only set a target of £1,000 because I didn't really know how it was going to work. Now we'd, we'd smash that straight away. But I thought there was more to it. And me being me, I don't really give up very easily. Get stubbornness from my dad. Um, I don't give up on something I'm passionate about. So I thought, well, how can we kind of tweak it? So what we did was, and you've probably, most of you've got one, or some of you've got one. We created books. And we started to sell them online. And basically, the premise was that you bought, bought your book, and the money that you paid covered the cost of the book in a donation to the charity. But I'm clever, you see, because I've got the logo on one side, and then I put the text code on the other. Because then if anyone else uses the book, you say, oh, what's that? So you get your phone out, text that number, and I'll tell you all about it. That's how you do it. Um, so we started selling mugs, and I'm pleased to say, I think we've sold now somewhere in the region about 470 mugs. They've gone all around the country, posting them out to all sorts of places. I've hand delivered some. Sally Lai, chief executive, tweeted me, said, oh, I'd like to purchase two mugs. And I was like, Sally, you go one better than that, I will personally deliver them to you in Northampton. So I took, an, took half a day out of my work diary, drove down to Northampton, it's about an hour's drive, just to give her a mug. But I then got to have tea with her and discuss how we could do more fundraising for the association. Um, and when something like that happens, it's good to have, because the, uh, the coasters are the cornflower coasters that are Sarah... Uh, you can say that? Sarah Zico. So they're the, uh, the eye gaze uh, coasters that she's designed with the cornflower. So it's nice that the association is picking up on things like that and actually, you know, they're displaying them at the, uh, the national office. So we started selling mugs. And I know that a lot of mugs got sold up here as well, uh, and they went all over. And I was telling, I was telling uh, Bill, sorry, yeah, I do get names wrong. I didn't say the wrong name. That's good. Um, I was telling Phil that uh, I went on holiday to Cornwall, May, just gone, and I put on Twitter that I'm having a break, I'm going on holiday, I'm going to Padstow, and this woman tweeted back saying, "Oh, make sure you come to Rickstein Seafood Bar. Love to see you." Okay. And she said, oh, my uh, husband's got MND, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I walked into Rickstein Seafood Bar, and on the bar was one of these that she bought about three months ago, and I completely forgot I sold it to them. Uh, and it was just sat there at the right place, in the middle of pasta. I thought, yeah, that's all right, it's not bad. Uh, so we started selling mugs, and then we, we, we branched out again. And again, this branch has been a massive supporter of the campaign. Greg is the man on social media, there's nobody better. 24 hours a day, Bob, he is there, okay? He retweets, he shares, he quotes, he requotes, he's the man, okay? Um, and we started putting it out there. We've got some celebrity endorsements, I'm pleased to say. So top left, we've got Stuart Broad, in cricketer. Hal Cruttenden, in the middle top, uh, he's a comedian. You've probably seen him on things like Live at the Apollo, if you watch that. Top right, uh, Chris Broad, Stuart's dad, uh, founder of the, the Broad Appeal. Possibly my favourite one is uh, Use Van der Vestesen, South African rugby player. He's uh, got motor neuron disease, played the same position as my dad. My dad's favourite player growing up. Absolutely pleasant to meet him. Uh, he does a huge amount uh, for MD work, both in this country and around the world. I mean, he's still living in South Africa now. He's got the J9 Foundation that you may have heard of. Um, he's been out to America and he's donated. Um, cells to be researched on and all sorts of things. He's just top, top row. Eamon Owens in the middle, whipped out, and he went with lemon water, but I'll let him off. 
could be lemon tea if someone gave him lemons, I suppose. Chris Ramsey, uh, sort of Geordie comedian, uh, there, me with a very dodgy looking moustache. Um, Sarah J. Me, who works for Sky Sports News. Another great ambassador for the Association of Bond, Jeremy Vine, top, top guy. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of months ago. And the lovely Karen Hoyer, I'm sure you come down to the next year. I wish I'd met Karen, but I got to meet Jeremy, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and then the vicar from Coronation Street, bottom right, who decided to take his cup of tea first thing in the morning without him putting a t shirt on, which is lovely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I'd recognise the tattoo. All oh, right. <laughs> Did he? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I'm going to show you. I'm going to you. I'm going to show you. So, yeah, the, but I believe he's. He's at an event, I'm not sure if it's this weekend, he's a big ambassador for the Evan News Association, he's doing some stuff this month somewhere, and it's part of a rugby thing, but he's heading down there and doing and, and helping fundraise and stuff. So these, you know, these guys have all got behind it, and uh, we've had a few more since, uh, a couple more celebrities got involved. Um, and then we started branching out into tea parties. So back in December, Manchester branch, uh, at Berwyn's Coffee House now, the Snug Coffee House in Atherton. Um, we launched an event then, and we split the proceeds between you guys as a branch and the T for MD. Um, that day was six hundred and seventy pounds, basically. Six hundred and seventy pounds. Sorry, six hundred and seventy pounds. <laughs> <laughs> it's about an extra tea at the end of the day. Um, six hundred and seventy-five, and um, you know, there's a few people in there that I've got to know. And one of the reasons I like this photo is you've got, you know, you've got Greg and Stacey from Manchester. You've got Sandra who made her way over from Merseyside for the day. You've got Jane, who made her way down from, is it Lyme, Lyme St. Anne's or something? Lyme St. Anne's. Lyme St. Anne's from Lancashire. And you've got Tony Gray and Sarah Lanny who travelled from Shropshire just to come and have a cup of tea, which I think is brilliant. Uh, <coughs> and the mugs were there, and we did all sorts of things. It was a fantastic day. Uh, Barbara was there as well, if I remember right. Very got uh, lost. You got lost. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it was a fantastic day, and we did that in Manchester, and then I had a, someone contacted me on Facebook and said, I've seen what you did in Manchester, can we do one in Portsmouth? So we did a team for League party in Portsmouth. I didn't travel down to that one, uh, but I sent some mugs down and, and they ran a day and the girl on the right, girl Cadelli Randall, she again split it between her just giving page and mine just giving page, everything we raised. And it's just sort of spiralled from there. Um, I then started sort of running my own. So this is a, a sort of coffee shop near where I live. Um, we ran a day there uh, over the May, uh, the May day bank holiday. Uh, and just local friends and family come down, but they pledged to bake a cake each day for that week. And if they sold slices of that cake, that would go to the charity as well. And they were all in MND t shirts all week and had all the, the sort of resources to, to raise awareness. And it's just kind of kept going. Um, you know, we branched out into doing little tea bag in the jar games and all sorts of things, all from this simple cup of tea. And it's kept going, and my hairdressers got involved. Um, they decided they wanted to run a day, so we did tea and cake. They were cutting hair at the same time, mm -hmm. safety. Uh, but tea and cake, and we did an auction on the day. And my hairdresser on the right hand side, he shaved his head um, from having loads of hair, and, and he raised a huge amount of money for that. <coughs> that day itself raised about twelve hundred pounds, and he's just kept spiraling, spiraling. And you know, we're now uh, going into. Sorry, I'll also say this one. This one. <laughs> Uh, this one, which is when we were at Derby train station. So we were at Derby train station as part of the Queen's 90th birthday celebrations. They were giving, uh, Eastern Indian trains were giving away free, uh, free afternoon tea essentially. So scones and, and, and sandwiches in the overbridge between the platforms. The local tea company, High Tea, were then going to give out free cups of tea and I went, we need to do something here. So I'm now in touch with High Tea as a local company. I'm trying to work with them to become sort of a a bit of trying to get the MD Association as a partner with them and become a charity partner for what they do. Um, we went down there and book it collected um, for the day on the Saturday, which we also sort of uh, combined with Download Festival. So everybody that went to Download Festival came through the train station, which was brilliant. Uh, and we just book it collected all day and get away free cups of tea, which anyone who's soaking wet and haven't been to a festival, cups of tea is one of the best things ever. And we've just kept doing things, and all this was done, uh, the last three slides I've shown was all done during Awareness Month. So Awareness Month itself, uh, back in June, uh, that raised £2,400 just for the month. Um, 
the last one we did was at Specsavers. There, my mum is on a photo on the far right, so she is on a photo, bless her. Um, Specsavers did a, a, a bake off every year, and I said, Well, cake great, but can we do cups of tea as well? So we did tea and cake all day, and uh, for anyone <coughs> waiting for their appointments, uh, and, and sort of book it, uh, not book it collected, but asked for donations, and, and did that as well. And we just kept going, really, and it, it just keeps branching out, and I'm still getting people coming to me saying, can we run a tea for MMD party? And the answer is, yeah. Um, I'm not precious about it. I'm, I'm not bothered if the money goes on to my just giving page or somebody else's just giving page, as long as it's going for the charity. But there's a brand there that works, that people are aware of, that's simple to do, that gets people together and talking. Um, and when all's said and done, you know, there aren't many people in the room that don't like having a cup of tea. So it's worth doing. Um, then Yorkshire Tea got involved, and uh, I'd been contacting them because they did a, they do a selfie thing on online at the moment. They do hashtag Tea on the train because I think they service most of the train companies. So there's people with Yorkshire Tea mugs everywhere on the train. And I contacted them and says, "Oh, it'd be great if we could link up and Tea for MND and Yorkshire Tea." You know, and they said, "Unfortunately, we only support local charities in Yorkshire." I said, well, there are at least two Yorkshire branches of the MD Association. Maybe you could link it with those guys. They said, we can't do anything at the moment, uh, but we will we'll send you a box of tea. So I expected this box of tea to come. That's what came through the door. Uh, not through the door, but a tea for MD tea. And so now I've got this box of 160 tea bags, and it's become its own little sort of phenomena itself. I put it on Facebook and it got shared 75 times and got liked 264 times in about 24 hours. Put it on Twitter and it got retweeted 140 times. I had 74 requests on how do I buy a box of tea. My friend actually bought a box thinking she would get that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish she could. Um, what I've done is I've passed it on to the Association nationally because there's something there that needs working on. They have told me it's difficult to make the, the individual boxes and they only do them sort of every now and again. I think they're fucking off. But um, I've moved it on to the Association nationally to try and link with the two local branches to say, look, can you do something with the local branches? But also, Yorkshire Tea are the big sponsors of England Cricket. England Cricket, Stuart Broad plays for them. Stuart Broad's got a link to MND. It all links together. So, go after them on a national level. I'm down at the association on Friday. I'm hoping uh, that something's moved forward with that. If it hasn't, I'll be asking questions. Because I'm good at that. And to date, as of today, £13,098 has been raised for the T for MND campaign alone. So that's where we are. Um, and what it brings us to is how and why do you create a campaign? There's people in this room that fundraise and want to fundraise. These are sort of my, the, my top tips. I don't confess to be an ex fundraiser extraordinaire or anything like that. Um, everything I've done, I've learned from mistakes. Um, everything I've done, I've done because it's fun. Um, but create a brand and create a buzz. Um, you know, why go out and put a coffee morning on when you could do tea for MD? people will recognise it, they might have heard of it, they might have seen it on Twitter or Facebook, because I'm probably the second person on Twitter and Facebook after Greg, he just beats me to it. <laughs> um, it's like the fastest thing at first, and it just gets there. But create a brand and create a buzz, you know, I spent most, that sort of two or three weeks in August before it launched in September, speaking to people online, getting their, gauging their opinion, what do you think of this, will it work, will you get behind it on September the 1st to give it that push, and you know, Greg was one of the people I approach straight away because of the presence they've got on social media. It's about talking to the right people. You know, have a fundraising plan. Everything we've done, there's a plan to it. It's not just random, oh, we'll do this, we'll go there, we'll do that. Everything's got a plan. I always try and put a minimum amount I'd like to raise for everything at every event I do as well. And I'm disappointed if we don't get it. Because I think, you know, each event has a level of what it should achieve. A logistics plan as well, because all these things come into play. So to say that last night I was in the South Yorkshire branch in Sheffield, I drove back to Derby, I drove up to Manchester tonight. You know, all this has got to be planned around working full time, um, having a wife, having a social life, a little social life, not much one. 
but you have to have a plan of how you're going to do things. You know, 2014 is a prime example of that. Social media. Um, social media is massive. It's not for everyone. Traditional forms of media are just as important. Um, if you want to get things in the press, write it for them. Make it easy. Give them the pictures. Ask them what dimensions they want the pictures in. And just give it to them. Say, look, there it is. Do your job for you. Because I guarantee there'll be a reporter sat somewhere drinking a cup of tea at the desk going, that's easy for me, job done, boom. But if they have to come out and meet you, take a photo, write an article, you might not get it. Um, be innovative and creative. I can't say that tea for MD is innovative, it's a cup of tea, but it's worked and it's got out there. Um, don't neglect the traditional fundraising. Traditional fundraising has its place, and by traditional fundraising I mean your raffles, your bucket collections, your, your, your cake sales, all those sorts of things, but add it on to something else that makes something a little bit bigger. Many hands make light work, get a support team behind you. My mum and my brother are fantastic supporters for everything I do. They're always there holding the bucket, selling the tea, doing whatever they need to do. And I'm pleased to say, you know, I've got a wider support team. If I put something out there now saying T for M and D is doing this on this day, I'll probably get ten replies straight away. Yeah I can, yeah I can, yeah I can. Because it's they want to get behind something uh, and there's something there to get behind. So they're getting the media on board, be prepared to be knocked back. It will happen. You send out 100 letters for raffle prizes, you might get 10. So just send out 500 letters, then you'll get 50. Uh, but it takes that time and effort to doing that. And if you do get knocked back, just go ask nicely again. I'm, I am not finished with Yorkshire Tea yet. Mm -hmm. I will get them on board somehow. I don't know how, uh, but I'm going to do it. Breaking fundraising down into manageable chunks. If you are taking on one of the international challenges or anything like that, um, it seems like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money, but you need to just break it down bit by bit. So if it's £5,000, break it down into £500, and then celebrate every £500 you make, because it's important that you recognise that what you're doing is important. Um, and if you're trying to raise £5,000 and you raise four, no one's going to turn around and go, well, you failed at that. They're going to thank you for raising £4,000. So, you know, sustainable partnerships, it's the second time I've been up to the Manchester branch and you're always very welcoming. But it's because we've put something in place. You know, I've met Greg on numerous occasions now, different things. He stood in the rain and waited for us at Old Trafford during 2014. He bought me a beer when I got off my bike. You know, things like that mean a lot. Um, and I'll always come and help um, and try and work with those partners that, that, that we've worked with in the past. And then celebrate success, make it fun, raising. That's why it's there. That's why we do it. Um, and if you do all that, and if you get it right, the last thing I'll say is um, one of the great things the M&D Association do is you can create a tribute fund and you can put it in a person's name. And I found out about this late, but I've been working with them over the past few months to try and get it up to date. Um, and I'm pleased to say that the Stephen Collins Tribute Fund has raised £82,500 in eight years. <laughs> Is there anyone downside to that? Is it 100 sounds a lot better, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it does though, doesn't it? Let's be honest. 82 and a half is fantastic, but there's a little bit in there that says 100,000 just got a good ring to it. So, what, we're 17 and a half away. Um, I reckon that's another good campaign. Um, I'm going to have to take a little break. I'm going to become a dad in five weeks. I will let you know what the little bundle of joy comes out looking like and whether they've got bits or no bits. If you've been busy, you've been busy you did that. I will be busy with that. No, no. if you've been busy, you did that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> I have a hook now, I'm not going to say. <laughs> I'm going to take a break. <laughs> I'm going to take a break, but the plan, the plan is that Team for M&D is going to carry on. Um, we turned one year old in September, so and although the money's sort of coming in at a slower rate now, the awareness is still out there. People are still wanting to buy mugs. People are still coming forward and asking to to organise events. 
Um, self tees are few and far between, but you never know, we could take one to Lana, raise a bit of interest. Um, good plan. Um, but it's still all there, and people still want to be part of it. So I don't see why it should stop. The support team that I've created, um, sorry, am I taking time? No, 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 I'm just, just um, um, I've got no watch on. Um, the support team I've created, we've sat down, um, and this is where, you know, fundraising, when you start fundraising like this, it becomes a bit of a business. We have meetings around fundraising, like the committee have meetings, but we're just volunteers. We, you know, I'm doing it on my 45 minute lunch break at work and, and all these sorts of things where I'm taking half a day off work to drive up to Manchester. Or, um, we've got an idea next year after we turn one, uh, instead of doing lots and lots of little events, we still want to see those continue. And if branches want to do them and support with the please just go and do it. If you want some tea for MND months and that to do it with, just let us know and we'll help try and source them and get them out there for you. Um, we're going to try and aim to do sort of four big events next year if we can. That's the aim, rather than do sort of 10, 12 little events. So one of the ideas we've got is potentially next summer, so I've got a year to sleep, hopefully at some point, um, is to do a bit like a black tie ball, but an afternoon tea party, an entrance fee to come, live music, sit down, champagne, afternoon tea, etc, etc. That's the aim, is one of the big events next year, um, is to do something along those lines, but still under the T for MND banner. And then maybe uh, sort of, you know, two or three other little, smaller events, but the aim is to try and raise a similar amount of money to what we've done this year, but in three, four chunks rather than 10, 12 chunks. That's the plan. Um, that's me done for tonight. Um, it's been eight years, it's been and as I said at the start, you know, it starts with the darkest day, a really big negative. But if you look at what I've done in eight years, it's shaped my life in a way. Um, and I'm thankful for that to some extent. Um, I'm not thankful that I can't share it with my dad or my auntie. But I think that sums it up for them in, in one fell swoop. And I'll just keep doing it. And I don't see the point. I do want to get to a point where... Um, we don't have to fundraise anymore. Where someone can go to the doctors and you know they get a diagnosis of motor neuron disease and then they're told something we can do, not will make you comfortable. That needs to change. Um, I'll keep doing it. Lots of other people keep doing it in this room, and and you know I'm, I'm as well as fundraising myself. I don't think there's one just giving pace that goes past me on Facebook that I don't chuck a quid on or two quid on. I wouldn't like to think how much money I've invested myself into is probably, well it's not that much, but it's a good, it's a good trouble, 10% of it maybe over eight years of investing my own money into things because it matters um, and it continues to matter and until it doesn't I'll keep doing it and hopefully Team MND will keep growing. Team MND is everyone, you know, whether you're the volunteer in the branch, whether you're a fundraiser, whether you're a campaigner, whether you're someone who just turns up and wears a t-shirt, you're part of Team MND, it means something. Um, and we are one big group, and we are one big family, and I say it, and I always say it, Sue knows what I'm gonna say now, because I've said it before. It's a family you don't want to be part of, but when you're in it, you don't want to leave. And I really truly believe that. Um, and so, I hope that I can keep in touch with lots of you, because that's why, that's why I come to these things. Um, and I'll finish with something for the branch. I went to South Yorkshire last night, and they spoke so highly of the Manchester branch because of all the work you do, both fundraising, campaigning, everything you do as a branch and the presence you've got on social media and in person. They, they couldn't speak highly enough when that came from the chairman of the South Yorkshire branch. So, big, massive pat on the backs of what you do. Um, keep doing it, keep helping people in Manchester. Uh, and who knows, I might be up here doing another tea party at some point. Thank you very much. I hope it's really inspired everybody. Yeah. 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 Thank you. No worries, thank you. I like the fact that Team L and D is part of T for L and D. I see. Never miss a trip. <laughs> <laughs> Never miss a trip. <laughs>